People don't understand antidepressant withdrawal. They know opiate withdrawal, and it does not feel like a normal withdrawal. It's not like a hangover or a painkiller withdrawal. It's just like being put in a horror movie. I literally locked myself in my apartment and just waited it out thinking I was nuts. There was intense, intense mood swings. Rage, really, really severe rage, like destructive rage. F it was like two and a half years. Like that could have been my parents' lives. Like my dad in a hospital, actively being tortured from the side effects. My mom bringing him food every day from medications he just needed to be taken off of. I'm pissed off about it. Hey folks, I thought advertising for Schwenk Grills was a good idea for this specific episode because of the topics we cover, psych med withdrawal, and how I really only survived through that without more misery because of the lion diet, the all meat diet I'm on. Because of the diet, I have tried basically every meat company and grill out there, at least in North America, and I can personally vouch for how amazing the Schwenk Grills specifically are. I own one and it has produced some of the best tasting steaks I've had. Right now, Schwenk Grills has an amazing discount, the biggest discount I've ever seen them do, and they say they've ever done, with $255 off when you use code MP255 at checkout. Their Black Friday deal was supposed to end November 30th, but for my listeners only, it has been extended to December 5th with code MP255. Typical grills reach a temperature of around 600 degrees. Schwenk grills reach 1500 degrees, which is what you get when you go to high-end steakhouses like Morton's. The grills are also portable, so you can take them on the road, camping, or to any place outdoors where you need to cook a steak. You never know when you're gonna need a steak. For better steak in less time and $255 off, just go to schwankgrills.com and use code MP255 until December 5th only. This is seriously the biggest sale they've had. So if you are ever considering buying one of these bougie 1500 degree grills, this is the time. MP255 and schwankgrills.com. Brooke Seam. Uh, I wanted to have you on my podcast because I think you went through a similar experience that I went through, mm -hmm. which was awful. I have your book here, May Cause Side Effects. So before we get into this, um, can you give me a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. Uh, so I'm. my name is Brooke Seam. I'm sort of, I guess, most known as a chef. I won the Food Network show Chopped a couple of years ago, so that's where a lot of people know me from, I suppose, but really the work that I mostly focus on now is awareness around antidepressant withdrawal, especially when it comes to medicating children and then having them be on it for really long periods of time. So my book is about the year I spent in withdrawal after I was pulled off these drugs too quickly by a doctor who didn't have any education on the subject. And this is this is the first book, it's a memoir, that exists like this on the subject, and I just really hope that it can help patients feel less alone and less crazy because what they're going through is a very real thing. And also doctors really needed to help identify symptoms uh, to avoid misdiagnosis, to be able to just have a better understanding of what it can be like to be in withdrawal for people who are experiencing this. Okay, great. So let's start with some background information then. Sure. Um, do you mind talking about what you were taking and how long you were taking it? Sure. So I was medicated when I was about 15 years old. My father had suddenly passed away and I was put on, we, we tried a few uh, antidepressants before we landed on a combination of Wellbutrin, XL, and Effexor XR. Uh, those were the really the only two antidepressants and psychiatric drugs I stayed on for my entire experience with this, which is pretty rare. Uh, a lot of people end up getting shuffled around. But I also collected about four or five other drugs that ultimately were used to treat side effects caused by the antidepressants. We didn't really know that at the time. No one had put two and two together and said, you know, maybe the fact that your hair is falling out and you can't keep any food down is, an, is a side effect of these drugs. Instead, we thought they were separate issues. So all in all, mm -hmm. I ended up on a cocktail of about usually between six, sometimes seven drugs, depending on what was going on at the time, uh, for 15 years. It was never questioned by any of the doctors I saw in multiple different states. I lived in three different states for those 15 years. They were pretty much refilled without question. And it wasn't until I suddenly had the light bulb moment that I hadn't had an unmedicated moment as an adult and that I was still actively suicidal and depressed that maybe this wasn't working. And that's when I decided to get off the drugs. 
Okay. Wow. Um, how old are you now? I'm 36 now. So most of this went down when I turned 30. So that, you know, big year. Yeah. Okay. So how fast were you taken off the medications? I was taken off Effexor cold turkey. At the time I was on 37.5 milligrams of it, which is the smallest dose you can get on the market. So this was also 2016. The, you know, literature and research on it, on the topic was, was scant, basically non-existent. So the doctor at the time, she said, well, I can't prescribe you a lower dose. We can't get that from the pharmaceutical companies. So just stop taking it and see what happens. And she, she said, I might feel like I had the flu for a few days or, yeah. you know, but basically just kind of a load of uh, very nice th things that sounded nice, but didn't end up being true. And so I was pulled off that right away. And I started experiencing pretty severe symptoms within about three or four days. And they only escalated over the next few months. And then I stayed on the Wellbutrin okay. during that time. And then later I was pulled, I took, I, that stopped cold turkey as well. Okay. Yeah. So when I, I was on uh, Ciprolex, mm -hmm. so I started taking Ciprolex. I was in grade, it was the summer of grade five and I was extremely depressed. So and so I, so young. So early. Yeah. It's so early. Yeah. And I stopped taking it cold turkey when I was 20, I can't, it was 2015. So I uh, 23. Yeah. Yeah. So about the same length so. of time ish. 10 years at least yeah. it sounds like right yeah and and i was on a lot i was on the highest dose that you could like safely i was actually on the higher dose i remember i tried to get a prescription at one point when i changed provinces in canada and they were like oh we can't fill this I was like what yeah you can't fill it i've been on this i need this right it's otherwise i'm like unbelievably depressed but anyway um can you describe what your antidepressant withdrawal looked like what symptoms did you have and how fast yeah. did that start so most of mine most of my serious, very like acute symptoms came from the Effexor more than the Wellbutrin for me personally. Uh, Effexor has a shorter half-life, so it leaves the body faster and creates more intense symptoms. Um, the very first notable symptom, I mean, I kind of felt off. I, you know, if you've ever missed a dose of these drugs, like I used to feel like, oh, I had just taken like four shots of espresso, you know, I'd, my heart would race and I would feel kind of shaky. So I, I, I anticipated that, you know, if it, I had accidentally forgotten to take it or, you know, the pharmacy was closed or something. Uh, but then what happened is one day I was, I was living in New York city at the time and I was walking on park Avenue and it had just started to rain. It was about dusk. And all of a sudden, like in, in one moment, all of my senses intensified. Like I saw the light bulb like come into focus and all the lights from the taxis coming at me went from round orbs into really sharp stars and everything got super loud and then my skin started really hurting with the rain the rain was coming down and it felt like bullets on my skin like little bb gun bullets and i was just so mm -hmm. overwhelmed by this sensory feeling and that's the first time i realized that something something big is about to happen to me and these drugs were doing a lot more than just you know keeping my depression at bay which is what i assumed was the only effect that they were having I realized in that moment that they were having an effect on my entire physical system. And that in some ways was actually kind of cool because I was like, oh my God, it's like, I've just woken up. Like what else, what else is there? Yeah. <laughs> but then the psychological side effects set in for me. And those were just the horrific ones. I mean, the, for me, the worst part was violent intrusive thoughts that just went on for months. And it's just, you know, it's a little difficult to explain, but it's kind of like this, the, this awareness that you have the ability to hurt yourself or others at any moment. And then you can kind of see in your mind's eye what you might do. And if you'd never experienced that before, you, I thought I was absolutely crazy. Like, obviously I needed to be on psychiatric medications because this is who mm -hmm. I am on the inside. That's, that's what I thought, but I was too terrified to tell my psychiatrist about it because I thought she would put me on an involuntary hold. So I just ended up like, I literally locked myself in my apartment and just, you know, waited it out thinking I was nuts. And um, that was the hardest one for me to deal with mentally. But then there was, you know, the intense mood swings, you know, intense, intense mood swings, rage, really, really severe rage, like destructive rage. I stopped sleeping. Um, I didn't have acesthesia too, I don't think. Like if I did, it was more in just like a general pacing kind of antsiness that I associated with just 
so many changes, but, you know, I know a little bit about what you've described in your anesthesia situation. Like I didn't feel like that. And I just feel like, my God, I was so lucky not to have to have gone through that. I mean, I was, yeah. Well, after seeing what happened to my dad. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, I stopped taking them cold turkey too. And and, um, I'd been on, I'd been off and on Wellbutrin for, for a while, but I actually, I ended up having a seizure on Wellbutrin. So I'd stopped taking that when I was 21. I was on, they like increased the dose to try Mm -hmm. and get a hold of the like depression and get the depression symptoms under control. And then I had a seizure. Mm -hmm. So we got rid of that one, Mm -hmm. which I don't, I think I just felt better getting rid of that one. Mm -hmm. But, um, the Ciprolex, I felt pretty good. Like I got my depression under control with dietary changes. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, don't need this thing anymore. Stop taking that. And then I felt pretty good for about a week. And then, and like, good. Like, oh, wow, I can feel I'm not Mm -hmm. sedated. Like, Things are great. And then it was really for me at like a two week period yep. where I went and it, it it almost went from like normal to suddenly horrifying yep. in it, like like a moment. Yeah. yeah it yep. was a day. And I think it coincided like um for me, I was trying to reintroduce more like carbier food. So I mm-hmm. tried to introduce a food and had kind of an autoimmune response. Mm-hmm. And then that combined with the antidepressant withdrawal. And I hallucinated. Like mm-hmm. I went out, it was the same thing. It was like, things are a little too real and they're mm-hmm. a little too close mm-hmm. and sounds are too loud and like lights hurt. Mm-hmm. It's like, And I'd always had kind of an aversion to fluorescent lights, mm-hmm. which might have been yeah, me too. part of being on drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, everything was too bright and too loud and too dark and like scary and um and i was like my heart was beating faster than Mm -hmm. it should and i was like i think i like am i panicking am i having a panic attack Mm -hmm. like what's going on here and i ended up hallucinating like my brother into kind of this demon face looked Mm -hmm. at me Mm -hmm. and i would like (laughs) looked at him was like went into my apartment and the same kind of thing turned on all the lights closed the door and was like okay yeah maybe i live here for the next while (laughs) maybe i live here yeah (laughs) yeah that's yeah. Did you, was it like, um, was it like, uh, that's the best way to describe it. Was it like a mind's eye hallucination or was it like if you had like his face was replaced in your visual field? I mean, it didn't like, I knew I was hallucinating obviously, mm-hmm. but my, he turned around and it, it, it had this horrifying like teeth. Mm. I think teeth like demon face on my brother like mm-hmm. so he turned into a little demon looked at me mm-hmm. and i was like okay i've stopped taking all like kind of mm-hmm. similar i've stopped taking all my medication mm-hmm. and now i'm fucking crazy right and, but then also part of me was like no i felt so good like i know there was a period yeah. of time where i could feel good so i had antidepressant withdrawal for two and a half years mm-hmm. um and and it kind of went like up and down and up and down yeah. and then and I just knew, you know, I think I'm pretty sure I'm not depressed. Mm-hmm. Like that I just need to, to wait. And at the time, actually, how long did it take you to figure out that you were in antidepressant withdrawal? Oh, did not, you know that you were in withdrawal? Yeah, it didn't take me very long. Uh, I I think like after maybe the first, you know, severe violent thought episode, um, a couple things happened. One, I had talked to a psychologist who was a friend a family friend who lived in a different state. So I was, she couldn't commit me. So I was like, okay, I'll talk to her. Um, and <laughs> she, she kind of helped me understand that one that she said, crazy people don't know they're crazy. So she basically made me aware oh, of the that's fact. Good. Yeah. The fact that since I was aware of it, then that, that is an important part in, in the process of making sure you're not actually going to act on any of these thoughts. It was still terrifying, but at least it like calmed me down from thinking that, oh God, I'm going to do something terrible. Um, and then she, you know, kind of indicated that it was about withdrawal, but she didn't know too, too much about the subject either. It really wasn't until I then just got on the internet and I started searching and there was, there was almost no literature at the time, but there were a couple of like rogue web- websites with other people explaining the same, uh, the same things that made me think, okay, I'm having, I'm having a reaction to getting off these drugs. It's clearly antidepressant withdrawal. I didn't know it was a thing. I thought it was really rare. I thought I was just like in a really, really rare camp of people. Yeah. And it's, you know, now I know that that's not the case, that this is much, much, much more common than I ever thought in that that we ever thought at the time, but it did make me feel like, okay, at least this is a anecdotally documented thing that I'm not the only one. 
I didn't know how long it would last though. I thought it would go away a lot faster than it did. (laughs) That's for sure. Yeah. How long did, how long did it take for you for the acute symptoms? I, the acute symptoms were about a year and at, at about a year is when I started to say, okay, like, I don't know how long, cause it's, you know, the windows and waves, you're kind of going up and down. At least that's how it was for me. And so about after about a year, a year, I felt confident that if I had a bad stretch, I was going to come out of it. So that's for me when I started to make the mental shift that, okay, this is not a forever thing. I don't know how long it'll last, but I'd be, I started to, you know, just embrace it. If, I guess if you can and find some radical acceptance for the process. And the more I did that, actually, the more things lessened. And, you know, by about two years, I was like quite confident that I was through it. I didn't know that it was, an- I'm so pissed off about this entire thing. Yeah. I didn't know it was anti with depressant withdrawal because I was doing these diet. So I, I've got a uh, arthritis and I was right. doing these diet tests And I was reacting quite badly to like certain carbier foods that were giving me arthritis and autoimmune Mm -hmm. flare-ups. And that coincided with how severe the antidepressant withdrawal was Mm -hmm. for me. So I was attributing the withdrawal to food reintroductions, just combined with the flare-ups and arthritis. Yeah. Right? So for the first two and a half years, I literally just thought I had extremely severe reactions to food. Yeah. I did like didn't know it was antidepressant withdrawal. I think because it took two weeks to hit, and then when it hit, it was when I reintroduced a food that gave, gave me an autoimmune response. And mm-hmm. it was like after that, I just couldn't, like, couldn't get things under control. And it was crazy. I was like having mm-hmm. hallucinations periodically. It was mm-hmm. like terrifying. It didn't occur to me that it was antidepressant withdrawal until Dad. So he stopped taking the antidepressant. Wait, can I ask, what's the order? Who went first, you or him? I went first. Okay. So I went first. I stopped taking them December 2015, about okay. three months after I started a really low-carb diet and we got were, my autoimmune symptoms We were going through this at the control. same time. <laughs> yeah. 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 When did, When was yours? Um, I started in like March of 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was, that was December 2015. Um, dad stopped around the same time it was later maybe february mm-hmm. and um i mean neither of us even though he's a psychologist he didn't know about mm-hmm. the antidepressant like people don't understand antidepressant withdrawal they know opiate withdrawal they're like okay people can get addicted to opiates they get like you can't stop taking those suddenly you have to wean off it can be unpleasant like extremely unpleasant it can depending on what you're on and how long you've been on it and what dose and all that. But they do not know about antidepressant withdrawal and it does not feel like a normal withdrawal. It's not like a hangover or a painkiller withdrawal. It's just like being put in a horror movie. This episode is brought to you by Better Fed Beef. Better Fed Beef is a direct to consumer beef company that specializes in certified Anya beef. You guys have probably heard me talk about Better Fed. I do that because that's basically the only meat I eat now, unless I run out of them and then I eat lamb. And I honestly, I kind of hate lamb. I ate lamb for a long time. I never really want to eat lamb again. This beef, on the other hand, is like Wagyu except they actually treat the cows really well. That's the other thing that makes these guys different. The cows are humanely raised on Midwestern family farms. The offer I have for BetterFed is insanely good. You can get 25% off your order when you go to betterfedbeef.com and use code MP. That's betterfedbeef.com and use code MP for a whopping 25% off your order. Normally that kind of percentage off doesn't happen in the meat world. And in a world where big business is taking over and the Gates family is buying up farmland like nobody's business, it's important to support family farms like BetterFed Beef. You never know if we're gonna be eating crickets eventually. I'm certainly not but I'm supporting these types of farms. Also, because of the craft butchering process, they use the whole animal, which is cool. So you get cuts that are typically hard to find, like oxtail, liver, beef tongue, and bone marrow. Their bone marrow is to die for, as well as the usual favorites like ribeyes and New York strips and ribs. Did I mention ribs? Their ribs are very good too. If you like good beef, then you should try Better Fed Beef. You can go to betterfedbeef.com and use code MP for 25% off. Mm -hmm. I've heard it's similar to benzo withdrawal. Um, I've never it's, been on benzos. So, so this was what this is what happened with us. So, yeah. antidepressant withdrawal was one thing. I was on lorazepam a little bit off and on. Thank goodness I didn't take any benzodiazepine long term. That seems worse. So, whatever antidepressant withdrawal, which was like that was the worst thing I've ever experienced. Um, and then I saw my dad. 
So he went, he basically stopped taking antidepressants and then didn't feel good. Like neither of us felt good. We were trying to get it under control with diet. And my mom got cancer and he started taking a benzodiazepine. But I think the reason he started taking it, this was through his doctor, of course, was because he was in antidepressant withdrawal. And so he was like, he was like, I'm suicidal. I'm having these thoughts. I can't sleep. He couldn't sleep at all. And his doctor was like, whoa, here's clonopin. And that was a bad idea. That was a bad idea. And I've done a bunch of research into this. There's this doctor named David Healy who's pretty oh, yeah. knowledgeable mm -hmm. about, yeah, the dangers yeah. Um, of drugs and like medicating somebody in antidepressant withdrawal with a benzodiazepine mm -hmm. just like destroys them. So he was on that for a while and then getting off of that, the withdrawal that caused almost killed him. That's when the akathisia popped up. And that is, that's everything antidepressant withdrawal is plus the absolute inability to stop moving. Like, how is this something that exists that doctors aren't screaming about? It's so unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I wish I had a better answer. I mean, I, it's just, <laughs> I, it, it's baffling. I, <laughs> um, I, I especially, I don't know. I think that part of what's happening now is we're getting into a period of time where people have been on these drugs for significant portions of their life. And because there's not a single long-term study for any of this stuff, right? Most most drug studies are like 12 weeks and you know that's where all the that's where all the nice sounding data comes from, right? Is from these 12 week studies. And so because there's absolutely not a single study on long-term use or pulling people off, like I think they just haven't seen it. And then so many of the signs and symptoms mimic other psychiatric disorders. I mean, when I was in withdrawal, I could have been diagnosed with bipolar, schizophrenia, or easily, a paranoid yeah. disorder, a paranoid disorder easily, right? And I think that's what happens to most people. That's that's how they get like so many different drugs just layered on top of them and whatnot. But I think there's also just been a huge failure in the system to I mean, psychiatry has been rife with not listening to patients since its inception, right? And you know, I don't, you can't fully blame psychiatry and psychiatrists as a whole when most people are getting their antidepressants from GPs. Like that's what I did. I got mine from a GP yeah, for eight too. years. And so they're, they're general practitioners. It's right there in the name. They're not, they're not experts on this stuff. So it's just, it's just, and then it makes so much money. So it's just, it's such a terrible, like perfect storm of events of why people are now so screwed um, or why some people are now so screwed on these things. I, I would say like, and I don't want to freak people out, but this like from just because I was so entrenched in this for first it was yeah. me and I didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. right? It actually, I remember I had this moment when dad kept getting misdiagnosed with mm -hmm. like bipolar schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I was like, he's not schizophrenic. Yeah. He's reacting to the med, like something's going on with the clonopin. Yeah. Like, He's not schizophrenic, you yeah. morons. Yeah. This is ridiculous. <laughs> and they're like, well, what do you know, like little blonde girl? Right. It's like also like how do you measure schizophrenia, insane. right? Like, give me a blood test. You can't measure it in the same way. So no. it's just, it's just like based on yeah. So annoying. Yeah. So bothersome. Um yeah. I'm I don't know. I think probably awareness is just the right way to go. I had somebody me message me. Like I I get messages constantly from people who are really really suffering you probably do now yeah. you've come out with the book yeah. but um somebody yesterday was like you know i'm i'm suicidal my i'm suicidal with depression and then you can do the one way where it's like oh go talk to your doctor except that never works because then you're suicidal with depression and better put that person on a benzodiazepine antidepressant antipsychotic something to calm them down and I, so i was just like well how long have you t been taking the meds two years it's like okay were you suicidal before you started the meds no i was just depressed it's like, okay suicidality is a lot worse than than being depressed i was like so anyway just like sent some information but finding a doctor that knows about this stuff is like nearly impossible do you have do you have recommendations for people who are currently on medications about like how to do this other than like weaning down and locking yourself in a room like there's got to be something there's got to be resources 
I mean, there are resources, but they're certainly not perfect and they are, they're very much in their infancy. And so it's kind of one of those things where, you know, I'm happy to kind of let people know what the latest stuff is. But at the end of the day, I think what antidepressant withdrawal and depression and all of this stuff really asks you to do is to go inward and find what works for you. I mean, you know all about that, right? With the lion diet, right? Like it might not work for everyone, but it's been a lifesaver for you. So like that, the amount of inner resilience and inner gumption you have to have in order to make that sort of choice for yourself, despite what other people say is huge. And that's what, I think that's in a lot of ways, what healthy mental health is, it's figuring out what each individual needs. So, you know, for example, like the the, the the main theory right now with, with antidepressant withdrawal on how to avoid it or how to get off these drugs safely is something called hyperbolic tapering. It's basically a dose reduction method. It ends up looking like a hyperbolic curve. So one that starts off very steep and ends up and ends up flatter because you make percentages of cuts for each drug. So say you're on a hundred milligrams of something, you cut it by 10%, ooh, you cut it by 10%. So you go down to 90 milligrams. And then assuming you're doing okay, you cut that another 10%. So 10% of 90 milligrams is nine grams. So now you're down to 81 and so on and so forth until the doses get smaller and smaller. And the reason why this tends to be more successful in the early research they've done is just because it allows the brain and body to uh, basically stabilize at an easier rate instead of having to make these big jumps in between the typical pharmaceutical doses. Um, this isn't perfect. There are still people who struggle on these, you know, and have serious symptoms even while doing hyperbolic tapering, but it's, but it's a start. So I would say, you know, Google that, read the research on that. Um, you know, also, uh, Mad in America is an amazing resource. So is anatomy, mm -hmm. of an, anatomy of an epidemic by Robert Whittaker. There's just a lot of information there that I think patients can help educate themselves and then go, take them to their doctor, take the information to their doctor and say like, cause you still need a doctor to like, you know, fill your prescriptions and help you go down. So, you know, the best course of action is going to be a partnership. If you have a doctor who's completely dismissive of your, of one, what you want for yourself and also, you know, information, continuing education on how you can hopefully get through this as best as possible. If you've got a doctor who's fighting that it's time to find a new doctor. Like, it's time to step up and take some agency and say, no, we're not doing this together and, you know, go off and find a new one. Um, so, and that's honestly, that's kind of it at this point, other than just <laughs> it's so sad, but other than, other than just, you know, reading the room, reading anecdotes a little bit, we've seen a lot more mainstream articles about antidepressant withdrawal and, you know, New York times and the New Yorker and New York post and all of these very like traditionally, you know, medication all the time people so i'm glad to see mm. that that means that the shift is changing or i mean there's a there's a change oh god glad to see that there's you know a change in the narrative there um there's also a lot more research being done in europe and the uk than there is here in the u.s so sometimes you have to go outside of the u.s and uh but yeah beyond that i mean it's 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 it's, it's a bit dark world out there but it's like, I don't know, for me, it was the best decision I ever made to get off these drugs. Like, yes, it's very oh, scary. Oh, me too. It's a scary thing. And I, you know, on the one hand, I want people to be really aware of what this, what can happen. So they're, they don't think that they are schizophrenic suddenly. Right. Yeah. And, you know, yes, it can be really, really difficult, but it is the single best thing I've ever done my, done for myself, even though it was the hardest thing I've ever been through. And I'm, my life is so much better. I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. This by no means means don't do it you're stuck on this forever it just means first of all cold turkey is so dangerous and it's not even just like um it's not even just that the withdrawal is sudden and much worse mm -hmm. it's also it can also trigger like secondary things yeah. like akathisia yeah in, in certain people and not yeah. everybody gets that yeah. but in certain people that can happen and once you trigger something like that going back on the medication doesn't necessarily get rid of it so the cold turkey thing can be very dangerous, especially if you've been on a high dose for a long period of time. But <laughs> getting off of them, yeah, it's been, it's, I, I was experiencing a lot of side effects that I had been attributing to my autoimmune disorder. I was just about to say. my entire life. I was, I was just about to say like how interesting it is, how all your other issues, at least for me, like directly connected back to this. It's such a systemic thing. And we really think it's a, 
we think it's only about our emotions and our feelings, right? And it's just not. It's completely systemic. Yeah. So you had, can you talk to me about what kind of like side effects you were treating that you found out were just attributed to the antidepressants? Yeah. I mean, we don't have like, I, I don't have conclusive evidence that it was, contri- that it was, contri- or that it was, you know, um, because of these drugs. But what I do know is that I didn't have these issues before. <laughs> I went on the drugs. Within a year, I had all these problems. And then when I got off yeah. these drugs 15 years later, all those problems disappeared. So I was like, hmm, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know, coincidence, maybe. Uh, but the first thing is, is I developed like hypothyroidism and all the signs of hypothyroidism. So my hair was falling out. I like was getting crazy Charlie horses at night. And then blood tests actually showed that my thyroid function was low. And so that's when they started giving me Synthroid, which is a synthetic hormone. I also developed something called bile reflux disease. Uh, this took a little while to diagnose, but it basically is like, it's like acid reflux, but lower down in your GI. So your pancreas spits up all this extra bile into your stomach. And then I would just get randomly nauseous and like, you know, be walking to, walking to school and I'd throw up on the sidewalk and it was just like, oh, oh. oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, I had something similar. Yeah. Okay. I had, <laughs> I had something similar. It wasn't like chronic like that. It happened, um, a couple of times when I mixed. So I was quite like the antidepressants initially when I was a kid and went on them, I can remember feeling relaxed and relief and being like, okay, I can sleep, right? Like I'm not having intrusive thoughts and, and all this. And I was already on immune suppressants at that point when I went on the antidepressants, but, um, but my depression was horrible the entire time. Like it didn't make it go away. And it, it was more intrusive, I would say. The older I got, the higher, and I just, you know, went up on medication and up on medication. And then my depression got worse and worse. Um, and I tried adding in 5-HTP, which is just, this, it's like a herbal supplement. And I tried adding that in and I threw up every morning for a week. I was like, what? I'm taking a supplement. This shouldn't just cause you like half an hour after the supplement on the way to school. On the subway, it's like, up, oh, throw up in a garbage can. What is happening? And it was like, oh, there's too much serotonin because of the 5-HTP. It's like, that's weird. But I was little, so I was like, you know, 17. I was like, well, okay, no 5-HTP. Yeah, so it was, it was kind of similar. I just would randomly puke. And so they put me on like a really, nice. really heavy anti- <laughs> That's fun. Anti- <laughs> an antacid for that. Yeah, it was so fun. Um, and then I was nauseous all the time. Um, then... Then like my skin got really bad. And so I ended up on a variety of like stuff, like either like tetracycline, which is antibiotic, which is bizarre. Eventually I was on Accutane, like that never really went away. Oh, which I mean, again, like it's like nobody looked at what I was taking and thought combining this was a good idea. Um, And then I also had like constant headaches and migraines. So I was always taking either migraine meds or a lot of Advil for that. And I just like dealt with that for, you know, again, the same, the same 15 years. But then when I started, when I got off the Effexor and then later when I got off the Wilbutrin, I was like, I was just like, I'm on a roll at this point. We're just going to get off of everything and see what happens. So I got off the, the Synthroid and um, the Sucralfate, which was for, for the bile reflux disease. Neither one of those things came back and my thyroid levels are totally normal now. Um, and then, and then the last issue that is still kind of a thing is just that like gut health has been an absolute nightmare to get back. And I mean, again, when you look at this, these drugs have a huge impact on your gut. Plus, I mean, I was on antibiotics for acne at some point, right? That'll, that'll kill your gut. And so, so many years, I think of that damage has made it pretty challenging to get my gut back on track. Like it's doing better now with a lot of, a lot of very expensive, like, medical help and supplements and testing and all that but um and kimchi (laughs) but yeah that's it I mean oh that's it and then the other thing too that's really interesting and I'm so fascinated about the audio autoimmune stuff and the trigger because I actually in withdrawal developed something called nodular vasculitis which is an autoimmune response to it's like a like inflamed blood vessels so I had all these weird little bumps all over my skin and like patchy discoloration that they thought was lupus but that's hard to diagnose. And then when they actually did a sample of it, it was just my blood vessels were all so inflamed that they like puffed up. And that's an autoimmune response associated with tuberculosis of all wow. things as a stress response from getting off these drugs. Okay. So I've been really interested. Um, and this is all like there isn't 
any – this is completely new, right? People mm-hmm. didn't even know antidepressants cause withdrawal. Um, I've wondered from watching what happened to my dad, which was just like the worst – I thought my antidepressant withdrawal was bad. And then I watched him and that experience was worse yeah. than like my antidepressant was so bad. Um where was I going with that? Okay, but it looks like a lot of the symptoms that you get from antidepressant withdrawal or benzodiazepine withdrawal mimic like nerve damage, mm-hmm. right? Like how can you have lights hurt and sounds? I still yeah, have it, issues with like certain sounds me being like, too. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, normal people I don't think have like, hey, that sound hurts. Sounds aren't supposed to hurt. And, right. and, like, right? and like you said, it, it actually hurts. Like, I can't explain how it hurts, but somehow it's like, it's not just uncomfortable. It's not just like, oh, like, let me go to another room. It like, like scratches your brain a little. Yeah. And I like feel I like in my bones in a weird way. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, wow. I, I mean, I'm not sure other than, I mean, obviously we don't know. We don't even really know how antidepressants work. So we sure as hell don't know how, how antidepressant withdrawal works, but like, I just, I just think they, they just must have such an intense effect on, you know, the neurobiology and your whole system. And I mean, like, what is it? 90% of our, of serotonin is created in the gut and just in the these gut, are yeah. SSRIs. So they are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they're. Well, also theoretically, mm-hmm. theoretically, right? Like mm-hmm. marketed as selective yeah. serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I don't think they actually know how they work. No, they don't. Like they have theories. Yeah. But they definitely don't act on just one thing because, like, <laughs> no, such a complex system. Even if something does act on one thing, your entire body has to react and readjust, right? So, I mean, I, my 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 completely unscientific theory is that, you know, yes, these they they blunt emotional pain, they blunt they numb the edges of both good and bad experience. They also numbed all of my physical experiences as well, and that's what I was kind of describing when that first moment when it was like the cellophane was lifted off my body for the first time and yeah. all my senses and nerves were like lit up either some some in really fun ways like color got brighter like literally oh color my gosh got brighter. my color got yeah color got brighter for me too mm-hmm. I was like that's what red looks like yeah and if you've been on these since you were a kid <laughs> like you just yeah. don't have any frame of reference for what red looks like and so that was great. I'm, I like that my world is more colorful now, but then there was the actual like physical pain. Like I couldn't wear clothes. I struggled to wear clothes because it just felt like scratchy daggers from the fibers. But I, well, who knew that that was going to be connected? I didn't. We told yeah. me. Uh, Still don't really so know why. Interesting. Yeah. No, I had the same thing. I wore rayon for a really long time when yeah. I was in like a cute. Me too. Yeah, rayon's nice and soft. Yeah. yeah. But then as soon That's as like so I washed strange. it a few times, I'm like, oh, this one's uh, gotta go. <laughs> Can't wear it. Just wow. Around like this. That's so awful. That's so <laughs> awful. And I, I'm sure there's so many people. Like I can remember when I was on them, and I, I took them religiously at night for like over a decade. Um, but when I was in university, I got quite a bit sicker. I got more mentally ill. Um, my diet also just went to complete shit. I was drinking all the time. And there were a, there was a day or two, like one time I got switched from Ciprolex, which is an SSRI. And I was like, this is not working. Like I'm on fire. Like some not, this isn't working. I need something else. I need more. And I got put on an SNRI. And I can't remember what the SNRI was called because I took it for two days. And they just added it in. And I was like, oh, I just wanted to like, just punch holes in walls all the time. I was like, that's got to go. That didn't work. Never mind. I'll just go back to what I'm doing. Um, but no, I'm incredibly grateful that I stopped taking them. Yeah. Well, Even who knows what that was, tur- right? Yeah. That could have been withdrawal effects that you started to experience. And then they put an SNRI in there, but you were still experiencing withdrawal from the SSRI. Oh, for, for sure. Who knows what's what, right? Happens all the yeah. time. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. And I'm also grateful that I avoided... Like, like when I started experiencing antidepressant withdrawal, this is before dad stopped taking his, I went out for dinner with my mom and dad and, and they're just like, how do you feel? And I just like bawled. And I'm not like, I don't, I'm not a crier. I just got, it was just like, I was in the middle of a horror movie. It was terrifying. And I just like bawled and I sat down and I was like trying to, you know, order my food and make sure that it didn't have any of these foods that were like making the autoimmune symptoms mm-hmm. worse. And I was just like teary and weepy. 
And my parents were like, whoa, yeah. maybe you should start taking those again. Like this right. doesn't look good. And I was just like, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> I am never taking anything again. Like, and yeah. I didn't even know, I think a couple years in, I realized when it, even when I started taking like, okay, I'd take an antihistamine. I can't take antihistamines. Mm -hmm. I get like severe side effects from antihistamines. I can't take anything anymore without getting extreme <laughs> side effects. Tylenol sometimes is okay. That's about it. Have you heard of the SIP450 gene and the SIP450 tests? I feel like this might be highly relevant to you and your family. <laughs> oh, um, CYP450. I don't know. Is that a pep peptide? Uh, no. Um, so, I mean, my knowledge on it is like, you know, sort of limited, obviously, because I'm not, I'm not a genetic researcher. Oh, interesting. But so the CIF450 test and, 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 and what they do is it's, it's designed or, or what they do is it's primarily using for cancer at this point right now. So they test you for these gene variants because it helps dictate whether or not you're able to metabolize drugs. And so, mm. but there's research from a, um, a researcher named Selma Eichelenbloom Schiebold. I think she's based out of um, New Mexico. She's testing this particular, these genes and these gene variants, gene variants against psychoactive drugs. Because what is starting to come up a little bit is you have all of these instances of, you know, severe violence that can happen when people start taking these drugs. Yeah. The question is why, right? And so her theory is that um, is that it has to do with these genes and that if you have what, what, like, what does she say? She says there's an association between prescription drugs, most notably antidepressants and other psychoactive medication, having variant al al alleles, alleles for Allele, CIP, yeah. alleles for CYP450 genes and altered emotional states of acts of violence. So these particular Ooh, that's cool. Yeah, these particular genes seems to indicate, OK, you can't metabolize these drugs or any drugs, some people apparently can't really metabolize any of them, which is why they test them for cancer drugs. And it creates a literal toxic buildup in the system. Oh my god! And gosh. that's why things go haywire for certain individuals. So like this, I think it's so fascinating from, you know, a violent standpoint, but then I don't, you know, I would be very interested to know if like your, your sensitivity, right? If that is somehow connected, like, is there just a literal genetic inability to metabolize a lot of these compounds that's interesting okay something's got to be going on because mm -hmm. so something has to be going on because i'll do you know um i had to have surgery for my ankle um this was after i got off all the medications mm -hmm. and um i started taking hydromorphone for pain mm -hmm. it was an ankle replacement surgery and i ended up it was okay at the beginning and then it was hives and then it was throwing up and i was like yeah. okay well can't take this anymore. Like within half an hour of taking it, throwing up. I was like, okay, what's that about? And then it's the same thing with like antihistamines. I get this horrible crawling sensation everywhere. Yeah. And my dad was the same way. Like anything he takes is like, absolutely not. We've realized Tylenol is mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. kind of. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Maybe it's that. I'll look into that. It's got to be yeah. some sort of inability because it feels like I'm having some sort of allergic reaction. Yeah. Like a like in a very angry way right well especially if you like got a couple of days where it sort of worked and then it got worse over time that could indicate a build, build up, up or just it's not processing out interesting yeah. wow well hopefully talking about this stuff will make people aware that they're not just you know that th these are serious and people don't know how they work or how to get off of them very easily yeah. That being said, I've also seen people get off of them without having nearly as many issues. Yeah. Oh, so have I. I mean, I think like some of the research is about 50, that it's roughly about half and half that about half the yeah. people who get off of them have no real issues at all. And then the other half about, about of the people who have withdrawal symptoms, about tw uh, half of those is severe. But then so that's still a that's still way too like one out of four and your sound yeah. is going to hurt. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when there's so yeah. many tens, probably hundreds of millions of people around the world on these drugs, like it's it's just way too, too, too many people, but it's certainly not a guarantee. Um, yeah. And it's, a, that's about right in my anecdotal experience too, about the people, like I've got a lot of friends and people who say, okay, well, you know, 
I want to get off my drugs. Like, will you, will you coach me through it? And I'm just kind of like, yeah, well, I'm not a doctor, but like, I'll, I'll, I'll help you make sure, you know, give you a shoulder to cry on and tell you that you're not crazy. And from my anecdotal experience too, it's, it's roughly about split half and half is people who are having a pretty hard time and people who are just like, I don't know, I might be a little weepy, but like, it's okay. So. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So it's not everyone. Well, that's good. Did you notice um, an increase in food sensitivities when you stopped taking them? Or did you not really notice a diet roll? So for me, diet was like, I mean, of all the problems I was having, food seemed, didn't even occur to me that that could somehow be contributing at all. Um, I've since found out because I have now been kind of on this journey to figure out why my gut's so screwed up that like I... I've stopped eating both gluten and dairy and have markers for the sensitivities there. And I, everything's doing a lot better since stopping that. So, you know, God only knows that I was doing that the whole time, but I don't know if it would have helped withdrawal specifically. Um, And I was, I was like, I was so kind of far gone in a way that I wasn't really even in a place to like consider whether or not I should go out and get myself some good, you know, some good healthy organic broccoli instead of just like (laughs) whatever was in my cabinet. So. I think I was lucky in in the way I never considered stopping taking the antidepressants. I never was like, this is a problem and I want to stop them. I was like, I'm going to be on these forever and thank God I have these. Like that was my opinion. But then when I started playing around with diet for the arthritis and the skin issues, and then that started, and then my depression went away. I was like, what? <laughs> That's associated. And so I think I was, I probably avoided some symptoms by cutting down because I I noticed for sure when I reintroduced certain foods that would cause the like hallucinations. And I just attributed it to the diet, but it was 100% because of the antidepressant withdrawal and and just flare ups. Just like, it was like the um, reaction my body was having to certain foods was the same as like sound hurting and light hurting. Um, It was the same kind of thing, but miserable experience wouldn't recommend it to anyone there are definitely ways to get off of them where you don't just stop taking them and then wonder what's going on for two and a half years yeah or even if you are you know going through a tapering process and you're being really diligent with it and you're still having symptoms at least you know why at least it's not this Mm -hmm. i guess i'm crazy forever depressed forever type of thing like there's there's a real and it does go away yeah it does And it goes away. People really need to know that because when you're mm-hmm. in it, it doesn't feel like it's going to mm-hmm. go away ever. And that's that's part of the really scary part yeah. is like whatever the symptoms are, it's like this is I'm crazy and I'm going to be stuck like this forever. I had those thoughts, but then I was like, there's a part of me that was like, nah, people can't survive this crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, people that like this state of being isn't survivable so i must be damaged and if i'm damaged i should be able to heal exactly. because like this is too crazy to last exactly god i think that's so important because the whole narrative in mental health is like okay this you know you've got this bad thing so you have to manage or cope with this bad thing but there's no focus at all on our body's innate ability to heal and how our body's always trying to get back to homeostasis it's trying to get back to like a natural happy healed point for our own personal body so like the brain is amazing it's plastic it's malleable it can change it just needs time and you have to give it time and if you you've spent so many years basically like literally changing your brain chemistry through these neurotropic drugs like it's unreasonable to think that like in my case I spent 15 years on these drugs that I was going to be like you know perky and normal after a week it's just need more time yeah and if you think about it like well as if like if somebody was drinking and they drank every day right then getting off of alcohol is going it's going to be messy right it's you're not hung over for a day or or two if you've been drinking every day for 15 years right and these drugs like they work every day so it's crazy to subject your brain to something that saturates all your neurotransmitters in something constantly for, for like a, a decade and a half for you. Yeah, and it gets stored in yeah. your body too. So that's why it doesn't just like, it stays in your body for longer periods of time. So it has to filter out and takes different times for different people. 
And then there's also there's like that, and I'm I'm very curious to know how you dealt with this because there's the there's the psychological fallout of it all too. Like, like I had not only created this whole identity around this idea that I was broken permanently and that there was, you know, it was my brain that was the problem. It wasn't me. So, you know, I was gonna be depressed, not just who I was. I had spent so long in that space that I had developed an identity around it. And so you know, it was very convenient in some ways. I had an excuse for everything. But then once I got off all these drugs and like started healing, suddenly I was completely, I had no idea who I was. I'd been medicated since I was a kid, since my dad died, right? Like there's, you can't use your 14 year old self as your frame Mm -hmm. of reference for who you are as a 30 year old adult. So then that process of actually almost like relearning who I was and figuring out who I was as an adult while also feeling incredibly stunted because so much of what I like I feel like so much of my emotional development was stunted when I was medicated. I had that. It that's been brutal in a completely different way, just because it's like I feel so behind and like having to learn stuff that most people learned in their twenties, and it's just it just makes me feel handicapped in a way. I had that. Mm-hmm. I had that for sure. Um, I didn't know what role anti dis- antidepressants had played in the development of my personality, right? So if, if you're on them, I started them, I was either 11 or 12. I think I was 12. And um, I had like a set personality on them. And it, now it turns out after uh, I started taking them when I was 23, I'm 30. So seven years not being on them, I'm like, no, I'm pretty much like I was on them, but much, much less volatile and much less uh, emotional. So the emotional part of my personality is like got wiped out. And I think part of that, like that might even be a hyper response to how I was. Cause like, so now I'm in situations like this isn't stressful at all. Like maybe I should be feeling some stress that I'm not feeling because everything was so stressful for so long that now normal things that should be stressful don't feel stressful. But anyway, I, I had that, I had that for sure. And I had it like actively that I was concerned about it. I stopped taking them and I was like, am I a good person? I remember I, I had that. I was like, am I a good person? Like, so yeah, I think that's normal too. And it was good person as in like, my emotions were all out of whack. Yeah. Am I fe- like, do I feel guilt? It turns out I do feel guilt. Yeah. But like there was a period of time where yeah. I was like, I'm not sure if I feel guilt. Right. It's like, oh no, the guilt is there. And then <laughs> it's like, do, do I care about when, you know, when other people are hurt? Oh, no, no, I still care. But, like, that's really scary to go through. Yep. Especially if other people are involved. Like, I know it's it's wreaked havoc on my re- personal relationships because I'm just kind of like, like, it's like, they, people look at me like, okay, you should probably react this way. This is an appropriate way to react in this situation. And I'm just like, like, <laughs> sometimes I'm either completely shut down or I'm just bawling. And either way, it's like, it seems very inappropriate to the other person involved. And it's just taken a long time to realize like, okay, there's there's an actual learning curve to this sort of uh, emotional reaction here that I am now having to learn as a 30-year-old adult, not as, you know, a teenager, which is when a lot of people learn this. And um, I, I only think it's now, I mean, it's been six years since I've been off these drugs that I'm starting to feel pretty confident and okay. Like, what is, who who am I versus what have I had to learn and walking that line has just been really tricky that's super interesting mm-hmm. i totally forgot that i went through that and but i attributed it this was before i knew i went through antidepressant withdrawal mm-hmm. so what i thought was i started a diet the diet helped my autoimmune disorder mm-hmm. and then i got really sensitive to the foods i was eating mm-hmm. for like a period of two and mm-hmm. a half years then I finally went on the carnivore diet to like just like, geez, just get rid of all the variables. Yeah. And then about five months after that, the lingering anxiety went away. Did you ever um and it I didn't attribute it to antidepressant withdrawal until my dad was like obviously reacting to the yeah. drugs he was on. Um, did you experience a period of like elevated mood after you stopped taking them, after the down? Kind of like you a get mania? Any hypomania. Yeah, or hypomania, something like that. You know, I didn't get it in the sense that um, I didn't get it in a way that like other people would have said, oh, she's talking really fast or something seems off. But it, it was more just like, and again, I don't know if this, I, I think I, I definitely kind of overcorrected, but then it has since come, it has since normalized. But 
I just, I kind of just had this like really big burst of creativity and, and focus in the sense that, you know, again, I wasn't sleeping. I went from sleeping like 12 hours a night and taking a three hour nap every day because that was how the drug yeah. worked with me to like, okay, now I'm sleeping four or five hours. And like, what am I going to do with all this extra time? Um, so I just suddenly had this urge to paint and I would, you know, paint into the night. And then I was, I was, uh, I knew I was going to be on Chopped and I was having a meltdown over that because I was in withdrawal and I was like, I'm going to lose my shit on TV and this is going to be bad. So I just got obsessive about flashcards and studying. And so I, I really channeled that. I did that. Yeah. You did? <laughs> like for school? That's so funny. Yeah. I was in um, <laughs> biomedical science in university. Yeah. I had a retarded number of flashcards that I had handmade. <laughs> I don't know how many flashcards. I think I had 400 of them. Yep. Like seriously to memorize, you know, biology terms, which is like, it's a way it works. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. weird. So I, yeah, I, I don't feel like because I channeled it so much, it felt very productive. I don't know what that might have looked like if I was like, didn't have a way to channel it. Um, but I definitely like, <sighs> it was just such a contrast between being down and being and being up I mean and like as even as I'm talking about it you can hear how it could so easily been given a bipolar diagnosis right <laughs> using terms down and up and you know those sorts of things but um it's just like when I felt good I felt really good and I just thought maybe I was done and I felt smart and productive and clear and focused and then it would just turn and then it would be awful for days or weeks and just kind of never knew how it was going to go so it's just exhausting. Yeah. That's weird. See, yeah, that's that's super strange. I wonder what that I mean, people don't know, so there's not even that much of a use of talking about it, but why would that why would that happen? Like, oh, for instance, I I was put on OxyContin for my hip and ankle replacement when I was 17. I took an insane amount of painkiller. I was in an insane amount of pain for a whole year. And then I had withdrawal I could feel it for about a year after that. So it was like acute for six weeks. And then I was like, okay, it's over. But it wasn't. My brain, like every six months, I was like, oh, I'm a bit better for a couple of years. But it was kind of linear. It was like, you know, three weeks of really bad. And then three weeks of kind of bad, little bit of suicidality at the end there. And then, and then better. And then six months, better. And antidepressant withdrawal, which is why I correlated it with the autoimmune reactions I was having, because that was definitely happening. But they went mm -hmm. crazy up and down. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you feel fine in the middle of withdrawal for a while and then be back in, like, hell? It's so strange. Yeah. I don't know. It's a really good question. I mean, I would just kill for someone to do some very diligent brain scans while someone's going through this. I just, I mean, for all we know, like, stuff is turning off and on. I mean, we know that some of these... Um, psychotropic drugs they they decrease gray they do gray matter i think they they change they, yeah. they change brain size they 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 atrophy parts of your brain i mean and then the brain has to overcorrect and other parts of the brain like tick up and are overactive and so i don't know maybe it's just like literally the brain kind of going back and forth until it finally finds balance but we don't we don't know we don't have the research i mean these that's are just great that's armchair hypothesis here <laughs> yeah well it was wild when we went to so we couldn't get any help in the western world to get dad off of meds and and like dad's super smart so he'd get into the office and he'd like you know out talk the person but he was having like he wasn't able to stop moving and and he knew it was the the drugs too but going down on them made that worse it was like, this is bad. It exists on the drug and getting going lower makes it worse. I was like, I think they all have to go completely, right? And and we tried to go everywhere. I kept calling, you know, hospitals and doctors and being like, okay, this is my dad. He's having like an allergic reaction to the medication he's on, plus mix, mixed with his withdrawal. What would you do if we got there? And they'd be like, well, it sounds like bipolar, so we'd adjust his medication. And I was just like, we called 52 places. And I was like, okay. So we went to Russia and they just got rid of the drugs, which was so dangerous and so scary. Um, but he, he felt way better in like a, a six week period, almost like it was bad. But, you know, he didn't die in an asylum, 
which was what was going to happen. And and now he's like, you know, it took t- 2019. It took like three years for him to like recover from all that. Mm-hmm. And now he's on tour and he's totally fine and he's yeah. not taking anything. Amazing. Right? Yeah. But like this stuff, it kills people. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder how many of the people walking around the s- streets that you see talking to themselves mm-hmm. are on psychiatric medications and have been missing doses mm-hmm. or going up and down or being switched. Yeah. And that's not even their mental disorder. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh, Robert Whitaker goes into that a bit. The anatomy of an epidemic was one of the hi- hypotheses because the so many of the bipolar drugs and the antipsychotics like create major uh, brain changes over time that create the tremors and all sorts of things. I mean, if they're getting okay. pulled, pulled off and start and stop and left, right, and center, you know they okay. So they create major brain changes. Yeah. yeah. So that that's why. So I started on that, like, the Russia topic because when we went there, they mm-hmm. did scans of my dad's brain. And and they're like, oh, he has brain changes from the antidepressant use. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, what do you what mean? Is, do you brain know changes. That can't be good. They didn't like, – t- this. they're speaking in Russian. Oh, I'm, yeah. like, getting information through a translator. Yeah. They're just like, yeah, antidepressant caused brain changes. And I was like, no, yeah. that's not supposed to happen. Yeah. I was like, is that – because then that would have happened to me. I was like, that's, right. that's not supposed to happen. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's long-term high-dose antidepressant mm-hmm. use, brain changes. Yeah. Like, oh, brain changes sounds bad. Yeah. I mean, I think if we <laughs> think of – I I think that there's such a spectrum here, right? I think there there are – you know, there are people who can get off these drugs, no problem, um, no issues at all. There are people probably more – like, I think I'm probably on the far end of the spectrum where, like, I'm not sure I had actual brain damage, but I had really severe withdrawal. But then there are other people who seem to have, like, actual – like brain damage that you could see in scans and I don't know if I had that because I you know was nowhere near that ability to get a scan but it's just it's it's like complex PTSD right it's not just PTSD it's an actual there's actual changes to the brain the brain the organ has been harmed and it makes sense that then you're having these you know biological and physical symptoms that cascade down the chain yep pretty yeah. unacceptable <laughs> so you have it, – it's – I think, you know, this is going to happen to a lot – in more oh. and more people. It's just – sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, like, I just – I think that you and your dad, you saved a lot of lives by being going public with what was going on. And it was pretty instrumental for this book to happen, actually, because I remember when you started doing all the updates for your dad when he was in Russia – and the fact that that was happening, that told me, I was like, this is this is about to be a really big deal because we have someone here who's pretty high profile going through this. And this is going to get a lot of people's attention. And that really told me that, honestly, it told me that I wasn't, that I wasn't nuts and that the story really needed to be told. And it gave me a lot of motivation to keep writing this book and get it out there. And so I just, like, I think you guys have helped a lot of people <laughs> indirectly and directly from sharing that experience and just thank you for that. Ah, like not not going to cry. Thank you. Thank you. I've been so angry. Mm-hmm. I was so angry. Like I saw my dad just get tort I got tortured. Mm-hmm. Like hallucinating? What the fuck mm-hmm. is that? I want to hallucinate demons. That's scary. Mm-hmm. Like all, uh, other than everything else. Mm-hmm. But then what happened to dad with akathisia and then It was so bad. It was every doctor we went to. And it was like him too being like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Like, I'm going to die. I'm done. And then I was there being like, no, absolutely fucking not. You're not going to die. Like, this is a drug thing and your brain can heal. But like, whoa, did his brain have to heal? Mm -hmm. Akathisia is a terrifying thing. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have it anymore. So thank God for that. But I was like... Mm -hmm. This is, like, I'm not going to be able to stop talking about this because this almost killed my dad. And, like, it didn't almost kill him. It almost left him to be tortured every day from psych med effects in an asylum. Mm -hmm. That's where it almost left him. It almost left my mom, like, oh, it got me. But, like, when he was hospitalized for a while, she was, like, bringing him food every day. (laughs) 
I've got like a touch of <laughs> just a touch of PTSD from these of like course. experiences. But it was like, fuck, it was like two and a half years. Like that could have been my parents' lives. Like my dad in the hospital actively being tortured from the side effects. My mom bringing him food every day from medications he just needed to be taken off of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So anyway... I'm pissed off about it. Yeah. So that's why we started. Yeah. We started to talk about it too. It's like if there are other people going through this, they just need to know that they have to wait. They just have to get through it mm-hmm. and they're going to be okay afterwards. Mm-hmm. And then to also incorporate like this, this needs to be enough up in the zeitgeist that when people are considering starting these drugs, they, they know. need to know that this is a possibility and not in just some like form that's four pages long of tiny print and you sign saying oh yeah i was informed of the side effects like this needs to be a serious conversation with your with doctors before these medications are started and especially for god's sake for kids like these drugs still i was on effexor and wellbutrin like well they're still not prescribed they're still not approved for children why like why was i put on them i off label like it's just It's just, I think we are such a fear-driven society in that, especially like with all the, you know, awful suicides and everything that's happening with kids, that it's just terrifying parents into trying to avoid the hard stuff and to avoid looking at their own role in their children's lives and what's happening to the child. I mean, you know, I don't know what was going on with you or in in fifth grade, but like there had to have been something, right? Like, I don't know if this came out of the blue or what, and you know. I, I'd, I'd be curious to know, but I don't, you know, it's obviously your story. You don't have to answer it. I but. mean, it's pretty comp. Like, if I could go back, then I would, you know, obviously now knowing what I know, I'd say absolutely not. But I mean, I was very depressed. So I'd been, di- I'd been diagnosed with arthritis and I was on two different immune suppressants in grade two. And so by grade five, I was like, I wasn't on anything other than to like injectable immune suppressants like methotrexate and Enbrel. They use methotrexate for cancer. Like it's an intense drug. But I was like, I wasn't sleeping. I was having really vivid nightmares. I was having suicidal thoughts. I was really angry, like punching walls angry. I was just in grade five. And that was from like, honestly, this is part of the reason I talk about my diet all the time is I I do think if I had even just gone gluten-free and dairy-free and gotten rid of the processed foods, I think that would have lowered all of those depressive symptoms. But I can also understand like my parents, my dad was also depressed at the time, like looking at their kid and being like, you don't want them to hurt like a grade five or grade six or whatever. You don't want them to hurt themselves. And it's like, well, they could take the medication I'm taking. It helps me. That's what my dad thought. And it did help initially which just makes everything confusing. It's like, oh yeah, Michaela's calmed down. But then it was like years went by and I got like worse and worse and the depression got worse and worse and suicidal like impulses and violent thoughts got worse. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, like, I mean, I just can't imagine what um, the, the stress, the emotional stress on a second grader for all all of the physical stress and you know those those really heavy drugs and Mm -hmm. you know a young brain that can't rationalize any of this stuff i mean you know it's just the the i think the fear how much is that the fear and the depression seems like a natural reaction to a pretty terrible situation for what like a Mm seven-year-old who can't express themselves very well and you know obviously like i know i don't i don't know how we would address that with a young child um, but I just well, you can't put them on a drug that causes yeah. this kind of with like this isn't the answer. There's yeah, there's exactly. some something needs to be done, but I don't know how much uh, like part of the problem too is both my parents were also like ill, mm-hmm. so it was just like a family of sickies. Mm-hmm. Luckily, we're not a family of sickies anymore. Yeah. But like, so I can't. I don't know what you would do. Like, yeah, I was definitely depressed. I remember like not wanting people to at school to know. Mm-hmm. My brother would go. To, I, I was like, "Don't too. say I have arthritis. It's like an old person disease." Yeah. So like, don't say that. But I do think that the physical, like the anger and stuff, I don't. I think that was diet related. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of that was diet related, given yeah. the fact that I can get my body to calm. Well, I know what my reaction to foods is now. Yeah. And I get angry. So. Yeah. Well, and then anyway, it's probably it's, compli- it's, yeah. it's a cycle too, right? The anger is going to increase the inflammation, and so the arthritis is going to get worse, and so on and so forth. You know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty crazy. Just for like a little so what's kid. your plan then? <laughs> what's, <Yeah. your> plan? <laughs> what, what's your plan in the future? Yeah, what's your goal here? Uh, I mean, I my goal is just to speak on this topic as much as possible. I would love to see this book in med- medical schools and also in uh, psychiatric residency trainings. Um, yes, that book may cause side effects. You know, they use like uh, the bell jar as an example of depression in in some medical schools. They use an unquiet mind for um, bipolar. Mm. Shoot, is an unquiet mind yeah. bipolar or schizophrenia? I can't remember. There's so that's the thing. There's so many memoirs about psychiatric illnesses that are used as part of curriculums because it helps practitioners understand what their patients are going through. But there's nothing about withdrawal. And so I think that like we need we need that. We need that to be a part of the conversation. So for me, it's just as much knowledge as I can get out there as possible. Um, I would also really, really love to see legislative legislative change and requiring pharmaceutical companies to provide more reasonable smaller jumps in their in their drugs so like it shouldn't be that you have to go from 75 milligrams of effects to 50 to 37.5 the, the jumps are too big you should be able to get much much smaller possibly even custom dosages um you can get custom dosages through uh through compound pharmacies but not everybody mm-hmm. has access to those so i would i would just really like to see ironically more availability <laughs> um, of, of, of lower dosages for these drugs and smaller dosages so people can help taper more effectively. That's something we should probably mention too. So one of the things we figured out, um, well, one of the things I figured out that you could do to taper off these meds is use a compounding pharmacy. So you can like search them. If you're in cities, it's a, a lot easier, well, much easier, but um, you can have your doctor fax specific prescriptions. So if you're at like 100, you can go to 91 and they'll compound the medication for you and give it to you. So if you have access to a compounding pharmacy and you're trying to get off of medications, you can go down 10% at a time or whatever your body can tolerate using a compounding pharmacy. They're very helpful. You do have to pay extra. And there isn't really an alternative other than and in like slicing pills like that, Those, it means you're gonna go like up and down in doses, which is gonna make yeah. the withdrawal worse. It's just yeah, and you yeah. can't even slice like not all pills can be cut because then you break the chemical chains. So it's really important that you've got the knowledge mm-hmm. of each specific drug. I mean, some can be dissolved in water, some can't. Some you can cut, some can't. Some you can count the beads out, some you can't. So it, it's just very important to have the deep knowledge of that, which. I mean, the information is out there on the internet. I mean, because it's had to be. This has been very much a patient-led revolution. And it's because enough people are starting to make noise that we're starting to sort of, I think, maybe see a little change (laughs) very early on. Yeah, I think so. I think it's the same kind of thing. Like, people kind of know processed foods aren't good. Mm-hmm. In a, in more of an in-depth way than they knew 10 years ago. Right. Like they knew what junk food was, but they're like, oh no, it's more than that. Yeah. I think the same thing is probably going to happen with, you know, the more people talk about, talk about this. Plus, what is it? You'd probably know this better than me, but isn't it 20% of people are on psych meds? Do you know uh, the statistic? There's a bunch of different, I think it's like one in five. So yeah, that's 20, yeah. 20%. And then, I mean, it also, it's really hard to get data in the US because we don't have a centralized system. So you're not getting full reports. So the reports we do get are like from like insurance companies and all those sorts of things. There's more, there's more data from um, other countries. I mean, even like, I mean, in, in, Let's see, in 2019, 43 million Americans were taking Lexaprozole after another SSRI. That's just SSRI. Lexapro. That was the one that made me angry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, Brooke, um, where can people find you online or find more information about your book? So I'm I'm Brooke Seam everywhere. That's B-R-O-O-K-E-S-I-E-M. You can find me on my website, on Instagram, um, I'm not particularly active on other forms of social media, but I do exist there. Um, I also have a newsletter called Happiness is a Skill that talks a lot about these sort of things. And that's just at learnhappy.substack.com. Yeah. And the book is available everywhere, okay. where, wherever books are sold. Amazon, Audible, bookstores, UK, Australia, yeah. Canada, everywhere. Good. 
Good. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for writing your book. Sorry you had to go through that, but you may help a lot of people. So maybe the suffering so. is worth it Yeah. in the end. end. Same for you guys. Thanks so much for sharing your story.